நீங்க அன்மியூட் பண்ணுங்க சார் அதுக்கப்புறம் நான் இது பண்ணிடுறேன் நாராயணபாபுமை <laughs> Ramesh Babu, the future president, my dear friend and secretary, Dr. Rajendran, and all my friends in IAP. In fact, I saw Professor Ashok Dherari from All India Institute of Medical Sciences also in the beginning. Uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, do this session titled Preparing for Third Wave, a Pediatric or a Pediatrician's Perspective. Uh, the focus in this session would be to first talk about the so called third wave the myths and the reality what we pediatricians can do what we pediatricians can do particularly pediatricians in the private sector because i am working in the private sector i am going to concentrate more on case management rather than on government protocols which i am not familiar too much with and some update based on some reason guidelines and of course what i thought would be a useful summary for the audience now it's the data from the national center for the for disease control if you look at the data from the government of india it shows that uh, pediatric covid constitutes only around 12% of all the cases so far in india in the first wave this is around 7 to 8% and it has gone up maybe by around 30 to 40% to around 12% in the second wave is that worrying or not we do not know these are the statistics available at the government protocol but if you look at the whatsapp university thesis and the newspapers and the projections by people other than pediatricians i would say other than pediatricians epidemiologists statisticians researchers who handle computers more than children what has been predicted is that the third wave is going to sweep it's going to cause havoc in children it's going to flood pediatric hospitals with beds unlike the first or the second wave but the iap fortunately has given a good statement after discussion and has come out with a statement that we need not panic there is absolutely no need to panic because most children who are going to have covid-19 would not need hospitalization and it's not very difficult to diagnose symptoms if they become sick more than 90% of covid positive children are going to recover with home care and if parents are elderly are going to be vaccinated children vaccinated children need not be worried about children should lead a normal mm-hmm. life they should reduce their screen time take healthy food this is what is the current recommendation and there is no need to dread the threat wave why these predictions are all made on statistical and mathematical projections i can tell you if you go to the lit covid the resource center for covid 19 90% of the predictions of big scientists have gone wrong only 10% it's almost like astrology 10% only have proved right all the predictions have gone wrong nobody could predict the severe second wave nobody could predict the timing there is no epidemiological or medical data available to prove that there is going to be a disastrous third wave in children there is no scientific data at all and the experience in usa cannot be extrapolated to india and in general indian children have been more exposed to 
coronavirus is earlier than western children they will do far better and our vaccination with bcg and mmr though controversial might protect and government is preparing very well all the governments are preparing very well so that doesn't mean in the third wave children are going to only get affected so we should be ready but there is no evidence that third wave will affect kids more that's a statement which i predict i hope i don't prove myself wrong after a few months or years coming to the guidelines if you go to the net and if you go to the whatsapp almost every week a new guideline is being released with regard to covid-19 and with regard to miss c in fact since this is expected to be an update for practicing pediatrician i thought i will share some information which has come out on june 9th from the lancet covid commission commission which which was asked to commission a paper on preparing for covid-19 planning protocols and policy guidelines for pediatrics i was fortunate to be part of this expert panel along with several senior pediatricians across the country in different institutions what did the commission say about symptomatology all of us know most children with covid are asymptomatic and even if they are symptomatic they are only mildly symptomatic most infections yeah. are only mild and in the initial first wave most children had fever and respiratory symptoms now we are seeing more of gastrointestinal symptoms this has not been observed in the west or in china but in india diarrhea vomiting pain of abdomen are occurring in more children when compared to adults respiratory manifestations are becoming less frequent the proportion of asymptomatic children is expected to increase as age increases as does the severity in such age groups in fact the most vulnerable age group is below 1 year and about 12 to 18 years that they are the ones who are expected to land up with severe covid coming to the burden of covid-19 in children in india in fact the lancet commission analyzed the data of morbidity and mortality what did it say the mortality rates among hospitalized children was only 2.4% among covid positive children hospitalized that means moderate most of them were moderate or severe covid of course it was it had excluded neonates 40% of these children who died had comorbidity so a normal child should not die of covid unless it's an exception 9% of all hospitalized covid positive children presented with severe illness under 10 years of age the above observations were very similar both in the first and the second wave and i don't think it is going to change even if a third wave is going to occur so the lancet commission after discussion by experts and review of literature and available data concluded there appears to be no substantial evidence to suggest that children would be more affected or would have greater illness severity due to covid-19 in the anticipated third wave so let us not be worried about third wave too much with reference to pediatrics but then we pediatricians have a peculiar disease which the adult physicians and pulmonologists are not seeing frequently what is that miss c and here again most data about miss c emerging from india even though very few published reports are available the prognosis of miss c in indian children is not bad at all when compared to the rates of deaths and the rates of cardiac dysfunction in us but i can tell you from chennai experience from our own hospital our children are far better off with regard to missy they all tend to recover and it's it's a good news for all of you today simultaneously at this hour itself in bangalore the iap is inaugurating an app for missy today this is a welcome move by the president dr piyush gupta who has initiated a missy app from tomorrow any pediatrician who diagnoses missy can register and give their clinical data through the app it, of course it is waiting for some more ethics committee formalities 
This is under the initiative of Dr. Pierce Gupta, being managed by Dr. Jagdish Chinnapa. In fact, I was also supporting, supposed to be part of this inaugural function, which is going on in a webinar, but I couldn't join. Coming to the personal experience with regard to COVID data in our institution, which is a small private children's hospital, over the last 15 months, we had started a SARI ward with government approval, and we had hospitalized 2,102 children, out of which 252 had turned out to be positive. Only two deaths, fortunately. And these two deaths had occurred not due to COVID. In both the cases, one was a child with acute leukemia, myeloid leukemia, who had tumor lysis syndrome. This child would have died even without COVID, was incidentally found to be COVID positive. Another child had chronic vasculitis, developed renal failure, pulmonary complications died, COVID PCR was positive. In both the instances, COVID was the bystander and not the cause of death. This is good news. Most children recover. Coming to the data of Miss C, for reasons poorly understood, we had seen more Missies than severely ill COVID-19 positive children. 122 cases have been documented to have Miss C with RCBCH criteria as well as the WHO criteria. Fortunately, zero mortality. Most of these children received IV, IG, and also MPS. Most of them receiving 10 milligram per kg high dose in our hospital. Few recovered, at least I know in my own unit, four cases recovering spontaneously without treatment. And the cardiac outcome has been pretty good. Of course, we are analyzing the data. Coming to the manifestations of Miss C, this is a very, very useful slide for a practitioner. What does it show? All these children have fever. The cutoff in the WHO is three days, but even two days fever, you have to be very off. It's like early diagnosis of Kawasaki. What are the most common symptoms? Mucocutaneous is the commonest symptom. So a child having glossitis, chelitis, perianal erythema, rash, even if it is fever for two days, one should start suspecting Missy. The next group of symptoms, which is most common, was surprisingly cardiovascular symptoms, which included palpitation, tachycardia, respiratory distress, shock, etc. And the next common was respiratory. Most of them had tachypnea and less of cough. GA symptoms are seen in 41%. Appendicitis-like presentation was frequently seen. Abdominal pain was very, very frequent. Two-thirds of this, our, our series required PICU care. Lymphadenopathy, not necessarily cervical lymphadenopathy. A few had even generalized lymphadenopathy was seen in nearly one-third. Acute kidney injury was there in about one out of five cases. So you must be aware of these symptoms for early diagnosis of MIS-C following the diagnostic criteria of WHO. Coming to the recommendations for policy consideration, of course, I'm not the best person because I'm not, I'm not in the government circle, but the Lancet Commission said only a small minority of children are expected to require critical care. But what is important is that in a big country like India, there may be a protocol for COVID-19 varying from street to street, taluk to taluk, hospital to hospital, private to government. And the Lancet Commission said there should be a rational adherence to protocols by providers and cooperative parental supportive care to achieve intended clinical outcome. This is a gray area. This is where the IAP TNSC has to attend and ensure, uh, attend to and ensure that there is a uniform protocol. The Lancet Commission also said child nutrition is very important. They should not become obese. They should not starve. And all of us know which increased screen time due to COVID-19 lockdown and no schools. Everybody is putting on weight. We need to give nutritional advice to the parent. This is something which TMSC can lay emphasis on. Supportive services. We should not forget routine immunization. Of course, we look at immunization with, for COVID as soon as it is approved and it is available after adult population is appropriately immunized. Right now, pediatric immunization, my personal opinion is that it's not a basic top priority as of today. We should follow, continue the immunization schedule. 
and we should not forget the routine checkups for children with comorbidities chronic illnesses diabetes special children autoimmune disease etc they need to be tracked and managed aggressively the impact on psychosocial health our president also was mentioning about it the cost is enormous absence of school too much of tv and screen time we have to address it in a big way by counseling centers if at every pediatrician should become a counselor for the next child we see particularly adolescents in our practice with or without covid having discussed all this let us have a look at the latest recommended protocol based on the lancet commission report which was released 3 days back you know all of us know the iap is working on a protocol it released one in april the iap protocol is being revised and the lancet commission looked at the iap protocol all india institute of protocol institute of india protocol and the operational guidelines led by dr ashok professor ashok dhirari for the ministry of health and government of the government of india and they formulated an acceptable protocol what does this protocol say if a child has got covid symptom and in fact in fact this guideline is called a living guideline it may get revised every month and we may find changes this is not permanent but the disease is changing its color every day and every week we are learning new things about the disease if a child has covid symptom we should screen these children how do we screen these children you must look for respiratory symptoms gastrointestinal symptoms and you should test either with pcr or cbnat or rapid antigen test whichever is available in fact in many peripheral centers in tamil nadu we are better off we have pcr everywhere in the rest of the india there may not be facilities ra rat can be done rapid antigen test can be done but if you do rat and if it is negative if you still suspect covid you will have to go and do a pcr or a cbnat here i would like to tell you that rt pcr can be done either with an esophageal aspirate with the ct values coming from the lab or by a gene expert or by a true nat in fact there is some confusion many people even pediatrician senior pediatrician think the gene expert should not be done you can do gene expert or true nat testing if it is available the advantage of gene expert and true nat is that true nat will give you a report in 1 hour maybe if the if your lab is able to provide you the report gene expert you will get in about 2 hours so it has got great advantage over rt pcr and the indian council of medical research has recommended you can use rt pcr or gene expert or true nat there should be no confusion on this only if you do rat you will have to con- if it is negative you will have to confirm with a pcr or a cb nat or a true nat if the child is positive you have to refer to a covid facility or you have to manage yourself if the child is a child test is away is a test are awaited you should hold the child in a along with suspected cases with proper social distancing the child is turning turning out to be negative if the child needs hospitalization you can send to a non covid facility what you should do is to lessen the fear of the parents in order the children are asymptomatic even if there is a contact unless there is an immunocompromised condition there is no need to do routine testing for all children whom the parents think is the child is having covid-19 coming to the severity classification the lancet commission has followed the all india institute and the operational guidelines protocol as divided into asymptomatic mild moderate and severe this becomes very very easy asymptomatic is one who doesn't have symptom but for some reason pcr or an rat or a cb nat has been done you don't do you don't do any investigation like adults you don't do ct at all nothing is required on the other hand when do you consider a child said to be having mild covid 19 when it looks like a viral uri pcr is positive rat is positive that is mild covid fever with sore throat gastrointestinal symptom no fast breathing saturation is normal no red flag here again no investigations are required 
what about moderate moderate is nothing but pneumonia in the ari program fast breathing 60 or more below 2 months based on the w so criteria age based criteria or the saturation is between 90 and 94 and no signs of severe disease like grunting cyanosis they are not there these cases even these cases no routine lab tests are not required that's what the recommendations say unless there are comorbid condition of course it allows for cbc and crp as a screening test and if necessary you can repeat cbc and crp all the other tests like il6 d dimer they are not required for these cases once you have a severely ill child with covid 19 when do you say a child is having severe illness child with any of these central cyanosis saturation less than 90 severe respiratory distress lethargy and somnolence and confusion encephalopathy shock and multi organ dysfunction any critically ill child that becomes severe covid in these children nobody will say don't investigate you will have to do cbc lft rft crp abg if required blood culture and chest x ray are recommended so that we don't miss routine infections as well as pneumonia and if necessary you can repeat these markers after 48 hours if you suspect cardiac involvement an ecg is the basic test you do followed by echocardiography as early as possible and the child is having severe covid cardiac biomarker should be assessed troponin maybe cpk mb pro bnp which is said to be the most sensitive indicator of myocardial involvement in messi and coagulation markers may be done in these children with d dimer prothrombin time aptt and fibrinogen this is the algorithm that has been given and this this has been followed based on all india institute recommendation coming to the clinical management protocol this slide looks very crowded i will take one by one in detail how do you manage these children with different categories of covid 19 the recommendations say that if a child has mild illness home isolation or monitoring in a covid care center if for special reasons you need to admit the child and observe supportive care ors feeding monitoring vitals including pulse oximetry if possible or feasible paracetamol and we don't recommend nsaids for fever if child has got wheezing you can use mdi rather than nebulization with a nebulization and if necessary inhaled uh, beta agonist can be given a nebulization is discouraged and if we should request the parents to report if worsening of symptom what do you mean by worsening of symptom persistent fever for five or more days that's a red flag or biphasic fever fever goes off and then comes back reduced oral intake dehydration oliguria lethargy saturation less than 94 or any shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing if home isolation or monitoring is not possible admit the child with mild illness particularly those with comorbidities which include any chronic disease immunocompromised state special child etc otherwise mild disease does not require hospitalization may require covid care center in special circumstances when there is a child with moderate covid moderate covid is almost equal to pneumonia in the ari program and these children you should give paracetamol of course you and you should provide paracetamol plus salbutamol or ipratropium or even inhaled steroids if required supportive therapy you should strongly consider oral antibiotics on clinical judgment if you are not sure that there is comorbid pneumonia bacterial pneumonia i don't think there is anything wrong in offering antibiotics as per who protocol if saturation is less than 94 we should start of course oxygen therapy with nasal prongs or with face mask or whatever that is feasible when do you consider steroids for moderate covid 19 if there is very rapid progression but mind you 
you should consider steroids only when other causes of fever are ruled out if you think the fever is enteric fever even if there is fever for 5 days you should not be starting steroids or if saturation is below 94% on supplemental oxygen therapy beyond 5 days of illness so 5 days over 6th day child comes with saturation 92 you should consider giving steroid or fever persisting beyond 7 days with high crp we should consider giving steroids coming to the severe disease definitely child with severe covid disease should be hospitalized in a covid high dependency unit or picu supportive care of course should be given and we should start ventilatory measures if required non rebreathing mask 10 liters you can give hfnc you can consider you your cspo to target should be above 94 and awake proning can be tried in children above 8 years coming to the steroids the lancet commission and the government of india recommends dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kg per dose for one or two times a day but most western countries prefer one dose dexamethasone at this dosage five days therapy is recommended it can be extended to 10 days if in a if there is slow response only alternatively you can give prednisolone or methyl prednisolone 1 to 2 mg per kg simultaneously for the severe disease you should always work up for thrombosis in this case you should do d dimer hlh workup may be required multi organ failure should be monitored coming to the misc the lancet commission accepts the who criteria all of us are very familiar which says if there is a child or an adolescent between 0 to 19 years of age fever 3 or more days and any two of these what is it rash bilateral conjunctivitis non purulent or mucocutaneous inflammation similar to kawasaki hypotension or shock me features of myocardial dysfunction pericarditis valvulitis coronary abnormalities in echo evidence of coagulopathy with elevated pt pdt elevated d dimers more than 5 times acute gastrointestinal problems with diarrhea vomiting or abdominal pain in our series what we have seen is mucocutaneous most often cardiac next often and gi third and in addition to these clinical features you should have elevated markers of inflammation esr and crp or procalcitonin in procalcitonin the expensive we don't do it routinely crp the cut off is 30 50 mg per liter 50 mg per liter you should not get confused between deciliter and uh, 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 liter and see esr cut off is 40 mm per hour esr is 40 CRP is 50 per liter milligram per liter that is a cut off for elevated inflammatory marker more importantly your miss is an exclusion clinical diagnosis you should rule out other infection there should be no other cause like sepsis enteric fever uti toxic shock syndrome dengue malaria strep typhus and of course the i would say the least important least important that's why the who has put it as last The evidence of covid-19 this is very difficult to achieve pcr positivity or antibody positivity or contact but mind you today with most population getting infected just because antibody is positive you can't make a definitive diagnosis of miss c coming to the test for miss c the lancet commission proposed a first line testing with crp and esr and this page this these these complete blood counts may give you clues with absolute lymphocyte count of less than 1000 platelet less than 1.5 lakhs hyponatremia sodium less than 135 neutrophilia with absolute neutrophil count of 7700 lower albumin serum albumin level less than 3 gram and level 2 of course ecg echo pro bnp is recommended and of course inflammatory markers are recommended only other inflammatory markers procalcitonin ferritin ldh 
triglycerides, etc., are recommended only if you suspect other diagnoses are HLH and as tier two investigation only. Coming to the management, this is where a lot of controversies are there. The Europeans and the Americans are fighting over the dose of steroids. USA recommends one to two milligram per kg and, and recommends Anakindra. Europe recommends 10 milligram per kg. The battle is ongoing. Only the recovery trial will give us answers. Coming to the management, the COVID, the Lancet Commission has introduced a term called my missy or non-life-threatening missy, where the child is having fever, has criteria for missy, stable vital signs are there, no shock, no organ-threatening disease. In such a case, the Lancet Commission recommends low-dose steroid only, IV methyl prednisolone, one to two milligram per kg for three days, followed by oral steroids in tapered doses over two to three weeks. And aspirin is recommended, provided the platelet count is more than 80,000, or there is no active bleeding, three to five milligram per kg with the night dose of maximum of 75 milligram per kg to prevent thrombosis. If no improvement within 48 hours or there is worsening of symptoms for some reason, the Lancet Commission recommends IVIG. The reason why IVIG is placed below steroids is considering the public health situation where it is difficult to provide IVIG to every child with Miss C. In severe Miss C, if there is myocardial or coronary involvement with shock, respiratory distress, or cardiac manifestations, there is no doubt you have to be aggressive. Here, you, the Lancet Commission recommends IVIG and IV methyl prednisolone. An IVAG should be given in a dose of two gram per kg, and it should be given as fast as possible, unless there is cardiac failure or very severe respiratory distress. It is preferable to give IVIG within 12 hours. The maximum dose is probably 100 grams. Some centers recommend even 70 grams is good enough even for an older child. And of course, you should be liberal in giving antimicrobials, antibiotics until you get microbiological data that this is not bacterial at all. This is definitely missy. If there is no improvement, you have started this first line therapy with methyl prednisolone and IVAG. Methyl prednisolone, you are given one to two milligram per kg. The child doesn't improve in 40 years. At that stage, you should hit hard with methyl prednisolone 10 to 30 milligram per kg for three to five days. Maximum dose is one gram. In fact, if even this does not do the trick, we'll have to consider infliximab if you think it is Kawasaki. You have to consider Anakindra. It is gradually becoming available in India. Of course, you should consider somebody who has experience in handling these cases before starting any therapy. Then use taper steroids, monitoring clinical data and inflammatory markers. Of course, shock has to be appropriately treated. Coming to anticoagulants, the Lancet Commission recommends that you should give anticoagulants not based on D-dimer, but based on echo findings of coronary aneurysm with the Z score of more than 10, or if there is thrombosis, the dose is one milligram per kg twice daily subcutaneously. And this should be better done with a hematology concern. And once there is a severe missy, all these have to be followed and close monitoring is required in an ICU. The next question one, one might ask, how can we provide all this care to all Indian children? This is where the operational guidelines have been prescribed by the Lancet Commission. And at various levels, these facilities are recommended. Please go through the document for more details. What happened earlier than the Lancet Commission was an initiative by Professor Ashok Derari and uh, Dr. Vinod Paul, where they, they brought out a nice document called Operationalization of COVID Care Services for Children and Adolescents. They took help from experts and they have come out with a version on June 3rd. What does it say? It is desirable to augment the existing COVID care facilities everywhere. This requires manpower, this requires infrastructure building, and only in standalone pediatric hospitals, we should start 
pediatric COVID care facilities, and we should develop them. And the guidelines said that it is desirable to designate specific areas in the COVID facilities, if it's a general hospital for pediatric care. And we should allow the parents to accompany the child, as mentioned by Dr. Narayana Babu. For children with missed C who test negative for acute COVID, care can be provided in the general pediatric facility. This is very, very important. If PCR is negative, antibody is positive, Miss C is not going to be infectious. And these facilities also need augmentation of good HTU and ICU services. One interesting development that has taken place due to this guideline release has been the modification of the IMNCA protocol for fever. Those in teaching institutions and primary pediatricians will be familiar with this algorithm for fever by ASHA worker in the community. This is the IMNCA document, but I'm not going to confuse you with this. What the operational guidelines have suggested is a modification of the IMNCA chart. What have they suggested? In addition to screening for all warning signs for the ASHA worker, who looks for, who listens, who feels, and looks for danger signs, she has to find out if there is progression to severe disease. What are the qualifi qualifiers for severe disease? Fast breathing, grunt, nasal flaring, saturation less than 94, cold extremities, poor oral intake, especially young children, lethargy, seizures, and encephalopathy. Mind you, these features will capture severe COVID, will also capture Miss C. The moment the ASHA worker or the primary healthcare provider identifies this, he or she has to inform the designated COVID care center and arrange transfer to nearby tertiary care center using ambulance with oxygen and pediatric equipment and IV fluids if feasible should be started, oxygen should be given. This is one modification which the operation guidelines have made on the IMNCA chart. Having discussed the current changes in the protocol and also some of the recommendations from the Lancet Commission and the operational guidelines, let me summarize what a practicing pediatrician belonging to IAP should definitely know. Fear of third wave, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, has been blown out of proportions. Pediatricians' income and compensation have been badly hit by COVID waves. They are unlikely to improve due to third wave. Hope we won't be more badly hit. Miss C spike, definitely likely all over. Overdiagnosis of Miss C, missing enteric fever, dengue, scrub typhus, malaria, as well as delayed diagnosis of Miss C, and child arriving in cardiogenic shock, that should not happen. We have to have a balanced logical approach. Clinical monitoring and CRP are more useful for monitoring Miss C. Masterly inactivity with postural expectancy, that is the best policy we need to follow in pediatric COVID in most cases. Rendesivir, I'm afraid, we don't, it's not found in the recent guidelines, it's on the way out in at least in children, you should consider only for rare cases of immunocompromised states. Steroids alone, preferably high dose, may be appropriate if cost is a deterrent for using IVIG for Miss C. D-dimer levels should not be used for deciding anticoagulation. For routine COVID, there is no need to do D-dimer. You'll ask for it, you will get high D-dimer level, you'll end up in trouble. IL-6, I'm afraid, is a useless test. Please leave it to researchers. I myself don't understand IL-6. Secondary infections are rare in acute COVID and we see, but you should not be there. Our syndromic approach to pediatric emergencies, pneumonia, acute febrile encephalopathy, acute diarrhea, dengue shock syndrome, fever, exanthematous illnesses, acute dysentery. I don't think we should forget the syndromic approach to pediatric emergencies just because there is going to be a third wave and more COVID-19. Every case of severe COVID-19 or MIS-C requires a careful approach based more on clinical judgment supported by timely investigations. You require a lot of patience and clinical judgment and monitoring than sophisticated tests. Finally, let us all pray and hope that the second wave is the last one 
but let us also be prepared for the worst to come and let us upgrade all our facilities even if we don't use them for bc we will use them for pedi future pediatric emergencies save more children thank you for patient listening if there is any positive or negative feedback please mail to spspeed at gmail.com thank you very much thank you sir now i um, uh, request dr sinivasan sir to share few slides followed by we'll take a question and answer in the chat box we'll take a question sir am i audible am i audible yeah, yeah proceed sir uh, thank you sbs sir i think i like the way you present today uh, complete uh, approach to the covid uh, second wave with missy and expecting the third wave the positive findings for everybody to notice in his speech number 1 the death due to covid in less than 10 years children is only 2.5% so everybody need not afraid so we should be courageous to face any wave the most important point he delivered everybody is positive don't put them under missy category it may be a coincidental finding for a child who had covid one month back with antibody now can come with enteric fever or lepto or scab typhus so let us not forget the other disease before putting the child in missy it's an excellent point and most important point he said he imnc has come back again imnc was introduced in 2005 now this imnc is going to play a major role if at all if there is a third wave because most of the children are going to be mild illness or asymptomatic illness where the pediatrician has the role to teach the red flag signs of imnci to most of the parents to find out whether the child is becoming sick or not that is an excellent finding and finally he said that usually the general surgeon says that masterly inactivity and very watchful eyes are needed especially in diagnosing the missing sir congratulations sir for giving an excellent talk and a very clear talk not to give any fear to the people to the pediatric population that it is one another disease which we are going to face so thank you very much sir now as a moderator i think sbs has told everything what we are discussing for many week now it is very crystal clear this is going to be the final and that thing called uh, iip guideline government guideline other guideline it is a single guideline given by lancet and approved by many experts like led by ashok diary in fact he was messaging me about this uh, webinar also so i'll be talking to him after 8 pm so i think he has a very clear cut directions for facing the covid children when they go for missy or now what is going to happen if there is a third wave so just four slides only five minutes i'm going to tell you there is ex extremely mathematical data which i have, I have done today it's for tamil nadu and everybody can appreciate this also so this is my first slide if there is a third wave see the children population in our tamil nadu state is 9 lakhs and 37000 one year up to one year why i am separating one year because one year children are the most children are nice as sbs told that whether it is controversial or not bcg mmr is some way it is protecting the child that's why i said one year children population up to one year is 9 lakh 37039 you can see our tamil nadu data 99% of the children are vaccinated up to one year from the government system 99% today i just verified 99 slides are not moving your slides are not moving sir <coughs> it's moving sir actually no, no you only no, it's, slide is coming one by one it is coming one by one it is coming yes, one by one please Now go for slide show slide show yeah one please one to nine years show. please put in a slide show mode mo slide which is in the okay air. okay okay sir sorry sir thank you slide show the one to 19 years slide show mode yeah slide show but it's not going i think it's moving now not it sir no, not moving not moving not moving just putting now not moving no sir sir adu mele enable editing irukala adu first adu click pannunga sir sir you close it and not enable editing sir thiru thiru please be clear 
Hello. Now it is moving, sir. Not moving. என்ன So the total children including the 1 year and 1 to 19 years is going to be 2 lakhs 30, 2 crores 36 lakhs 07007 children we are going to expect in our state <coughs> so what i am saying the antenatal target for the state per 1 year is almost 10 lakhs 44000 and we expect the new bonds 9 lakh 53 new bonds are going to bond during this covid era 9 lakh 50 see this is the a uh, volume of population in children they are going to face covid whether they get or not this is a just data i am giving now now see how the bed i am dividing now the total children i said is 2 crore 36000 and odd 36 lakhs and odd the expected infection in children as per the government of india guideline and operational guideline is 12% are going to be positive that means we are going to get around 28 lakhs 32000 children are going to be positive out of this why i am saying this 28 lakhs during the month of march april may the total adult population tamil nadu witness is 22 lakhs in two months that means if at all there is a third wave the children will be numbers will be more compared to the adult that's what but we need not worry this is only mathematical calculation what sbs was already telling and the hospitalization needed for this children of 12% of total children is going to be 5% hospitalization that is comes around 141642 children in the 5% 60% are going to be either mild symptoms or asymptomatic that means 84985 children who may need just a pediatrician should see observe and home quarantine follow the imnsa guideline tell about the red flag signs if at all anything to the mother and the letter mother the mother come back if there is a sign the 40% of the children that is we expect during the third wave 56000 children can need oxygen beds they may be mild to moderate illness or moderate illness or moderate to critical illness or sometimes they may come with ards shock you know acute miss see also that means roughly if you calculate the 60000 beds for the state each district can have around 1800 beds per district 1800 oxygen beds this is this is my estimation of preparing for the tamil nadu for the third wave that means 56000 to 60000 beds may be needed if at all there is a third wave if at all the children are going to affected this is what our preparedness that means every district should have 1800 beds that means if we take 10% or 15% into consideration maybe 150 to 200 piku beds or hdu beds should be there per district per district that is the calculation now let us go to the uh, pediatricians available how much how iap can help the pediatrician in the government setup see the total seamong centers in the government is 126 seamong centers when i say seamong centers you have minimum four pediatrician minimum four physician minimum four anesthetist that's why it's called seamong centers out of this total 126 seamong centers 22 medical college has got a pakka seamong center where more pediatricians will be available the remaining 104 seamong centers are in the district dms con con control where you can see 32 are going to be in the district hospital where again six four to six pediatricians will be there and another 72 will be the sub district hospital for example if i take coimbatore into consideration pollachi is considered as district hospital where four to six pediatricians will be there and around gangayam daraburam and those areas can have around two to three pediatrician they are called sub district hospitals it will have 72 so if you calculate overall 
pediatricians available in the medical colleges in the state is almost 300. That includes almost 80 to 100 pediatricians in ICH. This is all government data. And uh, district level, you can have 128 pediatricians. And sub-district level, you can have 144 pediatricians. That means totally, if you include the postgraduate residents of one year as 100 post-PGs, and include two year or three years course going to be 300, roughly 700 to 900 pediatricians are there to take care of the third wave in the government setup apart from the IAP. This is where the IAP is going to play a major role. When I say major role, leave alone Chennai or Coimbatore. Suppose you go to Dharmaburi, for example, if you have a 10 to 12 pediatricians in the Dharmaburi, that number may not be sufficient. Even if you include Penagaram or Arur or some other sub-district hospital having pediatrician, they may not be more than 25 pediatricians. That is not sufficient. This is the where the IAP Dharmaburi should play a major role in joining hands with the government doctors, discuss with the government doctors if it is going to be a third wave, how mild cases or asymptomatic cases and near moderate cases can be managed by the help of the IAP. That is very important. If that happens, the Garmaburi Medical College per se can take care of the moderate to severe critical illness. Now let us go to the, so the total pediatrician I already told you. This is about the vaccination status. I think everybody should understand what is going on in Tamil Nadu. So totally infected as per the government data that includes adult is around 23% of the 8 crore population got infected. That means they have got some antibodies. And we have given vaccination for 13% of the population that out of 8 crore. That means totally 36% of the population are having antibody either due to disease or due to the vaccination. That comes around 2.88 crore. So 70% vaccination may be needed to achieve an herd immunity in a case of state like Tamil Nadu. That means our burden of giving vaccination in the next period, that is during the second wave ending, during the lull period, before starting the third wave, we may have to vaccinate 2.88 crore before third wave. If we are going to vaccinate 2.88 crore before third wave in the next two to three months, then we may be in position to say that and government is not reopening the schools up to September, up to Vijay Dasami, then we can say that the third wave towards children may not be not that much possible. So this is just a data to you, how you are preparing, because SBS has talked about protocols and other things. I am just mentally preparing you to see how much children we are going to get, how many beds we are going to create, how many ICU beds we are going to create, how many vaccination we can plan, or how vaccination is going to prevent the third wave. So with this, I can conclude my small slide presentation. This is just data to all pediatricians. Many people are watching to see what is the preparedness Tamil Nadu government is making, especially just I talked about beds. And all and we are in, in a mood to create a lot of oxygen points to all these beds. A lot of ventilators are available. A lot of CPAP and BiPAP and HFNC is available. I hope when the third wave children are affected, adults are less affected so that adult beds, adult uh, equipments could be utilized by the children also. These are all the optimism as a state nodal officer I'm having. So thank you, Rajendran, for giving this opportunity to moderate an uh, uh, excellent speaker like SBS to hear. And the protocols is very crystal clear. From tomorrow morning, I don't think any pediatrician should have any doubt regarding the management of mild cases or moderate cases or severe cases, how to diagnose Miss C, how you have to rule out the other tropic. So just for example, yesterday in my ward rounds, the entry fever is getting treated and getting all right. That entry fever, just for fun, I was stating the inflammatory markers. They are showing high ferritin, high LDH, and high CRP also. Similarly, one case of leptospirosis proved again. Again, inflammatory markers were raised. So that's why I'm saying, for many people are watching here, Missy, yes, it is there, but it's very less compared to, and you need not worry about it. And the simple management, he has told very clearly, mild cases, supportive measures, moderate cases, if they go for worsening situation, think about dexamethasone. Severe cases, with the shock, immunoglobulin with methylprednisolone. Severe cases without shock, where the immunoglobulin is not... In spite of the treatment, they are coming back with the same problem, second dose of immunoglobulin and high pulse therapy of methylprednisolone. And of course, he said IL-6 is not mandatory. That is a very important statement because even MMC, they are not doing nowadays when I ask for IL-6. 
So these are all the positive points we take from this uh, talk. And thank you very much for the IAP for giving the chance to moderate persons like Balasubramaniam, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, stop uh, the slide sharing, sir. And if you yeah. don't go into uh, questions in the chat box, I welcome uh, Dr. Kulandesami and the former director of uh, public health. And he is uh, currently the state uh, task force um, committee member. I welcome uh, Dr. Kulandesami, sir. I request your comments, sir. Uh, good evening to Dr. Kulade Sami. I welcome on behalf of IAP DNSC. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, smile. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> how are you? Uh, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> okay. Good evening to all of you. I thank uh, the under the secretary and president um, uh, for uh, inviting me for this uh, very, very important meeting at a very crucial uh, juncture. Uh, I think this is a very, uh, very, very much essential. And uh, I think the uh, I was listening to the uh, presentations. I think excellent presentations, and also the um, the state nodal I said at seniors and made detailed elaborated on the state's uh, preparation for this. So let us prepare uh, uh, by expecting the unexpected. Uh, anyhow, the all resources we create. Uh, they are going to be utilized either in the private or in the government for the benefit of the uh, children. So let us uh, uh, assume that we have worst scenario, uh, keeping a worst scenario in mind and let us be uh, prepared. So as there is a now um, upward uh, uh, shift in the age uh, for diseases like uh, uh, polio, measles, uh, or diphtheria. So when we are uh, moving towards uh, elimination or eradication, so we can we are seeing in the last um, several decades we are seeing upward age shifting. But here, once the uh, virus uh, closing in on the proportion of the uh, people infected increases, so it needs to infect someone uh, to for its own survival. So we can predict a downward age shifting, whether it is causing a serious disease or not. But we can expect a downward age shifting in the uh, the infection. So that is one important thing. And so before uh, 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 before closing, I want to just just to, just two points. One one important point is uh, that is in all our health facilities, whether it is a government or private health facilities, we need to segregate our services. The services meant for women and children, maternity and child health. The services meant for non-COVID emergencies or non-COVID services. The services meant for uh, infectious diseases, particularly at this point of time, COVID-related uh, So now, even a common sharing, the common sharing occurs at the canteen, common sharing occurs at the laboratory, common sharing occurs at the radiological investigation point and other places. So we need to identify how to segregate functionally, physically, or by timing, whatever it may be. I think each institution, depending on its size, it is high time that we need to segregate the uh, the, the services for uh, uh, based on the above three categories. That is very, very uh, important. Another important aspect is protecting the pregnant mother. So in collaboration with the obstetricians and other people mm. and the public health, See, immunize all the family members. And right now, there is no vaccine is permitted. Although we can use a killed vaccine very safely in a pregnant mother and for children, still the storage, uh, dosage and the technical committee approval and a lot many things are there. So in the absence of, a, let, currently let us assume that in the absence of an, uh, yeah, yeah, vaccine. Although a vaccine is available, we are not able to give it to children and um, uh, pregnant mother. Luckily, the lactating mothers, the uh, technical committee recently, Government of India technical committee permitted. Let us hope. I think they are going to issue uh, permission for the pregnant mothers also. So, uh, but at present, the, given the scenario, immunize, vaccinate, ensure that all the uh, family members who are likely to be the caregivers of the current pregnant mothers and discourage them to have the Valaigapu function. Uh, that Valaigapu function is the major source of the infection for a pregnant mother. And also the birth companion whom they are selecting, they are to be immunized. Only an immunized birth companion uh, is to be allowed in the uh, hospital during the time of uh, delivery. And for the lactating mothers also, now some, now those people who are not immunized, the lactating mothers, 
uh, their caregivers so they also need to be immunized so the lactating mothers they they themselves should be given the immunization so that we develop a ring around the pregnant mother a ring around the uh, the the feeding mother and uh, child so that the, the the minimizing the chance of uh, the, um, them getting uh, infected so these are the very two important uh, points that we should uh, promote to achieve to minimize as much as possible the hospital uh, infection um, then the infection due to the caregivers and family members so, so these two strategies we can adopt it and also i think dr rajendran he spoke uh, in the state uh, uh, technical um, state task force uh, meeting with uh, purnalingam sir and i think he made a very elaborate uh, uh, ar- arrangements the contribution that iap has planned to uh, do uh, do in all the districts of uh, tamil nadu so let us hope uh, for more collaboration and work for the benefit of betterment of the health and welfare of the uh, women and children uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, Uh, for this thank opportunity you, you, i wish i wish all the best for the iap tamil nadu state uh, chapter thank you very much thank you, sir and ismail sir, yeah sir, thank you know, thank you sir dr ismail sir you want to tell any point yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all i thank uh, dr sp sir for that lucid presentation very clear sir i think what was in my mind and what uh, sort of a protocol or a guideline what i expected to reach the peripheral pediatricians you have spelled out in a very nice way in a lighter way net the preparedness meeting la solittirundinga if i am a producer what i wanted to produce and as a director you have done your duty excellently and i hope the picture will go for 100 days sure sir and that was a very uh, crystal clear presentation by dr srinivasan sir of course the statistics he, he allayed the fears actually methodically saying that how much is going to be affected and what sort of a bed preparation is done by them and how it is going to be there in a statistical way uh, max and medicine i think it was really beautifully done by srinivasan sir thank you sir of course good inputs from dr kodane swami as far as the pregnant include inclusive of ogcians along with the pediatrician need to be addressed that's a good issue sir of hope the message has been given clearly by the iapt nsc to all the district branches we have da- we have motivated you to do what what is best for the children i think please take uh, take the message clearly and try to form each district branch president and the office bearers please discuss yourself have a meeting in your branch a zoom meeting in your branch discuss what all happened today everything is given and rajendran will be uh, posting all the things within the groups itself please take care of the clues and try to do good service to the children thank you thank you over to rajendra thank you rajendra thank you sir sir dr narayan bab sir is there sir you are coming sir dr narayan bab sir bme yeah is, uh... sir good evening thank you sir thank you very much for the wonderful uh... thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you for joining us sir thank you there are questions in the uh, chat box sir and uh... a uh, methyl prednisolone instead of uh, dexamethasone shall we give a methyl prednisolone sir dr sp sir uh... yes sir yes yeah. sir yeah this, this is dr a... sp sir yes sir this is another no, question which is uh, causing lot of uh, controversy uh, see steroid is steroid there is there are few minor differences in the basic pharmacology of uh, methyl prednisolone and dexamethasone dexamethasone has more anti inflammatory activity less salt retaining activity when compared to methyl prednisolone on the other hand methyl prednisolone achieves higher concentrations in the lungs when compared to dexamethasone the use of dexamethasone has become accepted mainly because of the recovery trial in the europe where they used in adults 6 mg of dexamethasone intravenously or orally for 5 to 10 to 14 days and came out and they had a comparative trial with chloroquine with all other things and this is what is the basis for recommending dexamethasone but in after all steroids are steroids if you want to use methyl prednisolone instead of dexamethasone 
is not incorrect. Similarly, if somebody wants to use dexamethasone high dose instead of high dose methylprednisolone, it is not technically incorrect. But the point that you must remember is dexamethasone is cheaper. You can give dexamethasone faster, whereas methylprednisolone is more expensive. Methylprednisolone can be given only as a continuous slow infusion. So these are the advantages. In resource limited settings, dexamethasone should work as well as methylprednisolone. Thank you, sir. Next one is newborn COVID positive and recovered. What, what about routine vaccination at 45 days? Shall we the same schedule or you have to postpone? Same schedule. And uh, yeah, would you suggest a chest in moderate COVID as part of fever or pneumonia evaluation? Yeah, extremely good question. CT scan in children for diagnosis, no. In fact, there are three things which pediatricians should avoid during COVID. One is throat examination of the tongue depressor. It will become an aerosol generating procedure. Two, nebulization in offices with a jet nebulizer. It's an aerosol generating procedure, high risk. Third, CT scan for diagnosis of pediatric COVID. CT scan is best reserved for cases where you are thinking of an alternative diagnosis. For example, you are thinking of a lung abscess causing fever in a child with COVID. Child, you are suspecting tuberculous cavity in a child with COVID, you may do, but not for diagnosis. Studies have shown a so-called peripheral parenchymal changes, which are very characteristically seen in X-ray and CT, they are not very specific. They are not going to help you in decisions on antibiotics, antiviral drugs, or immunomodulatory therapy. So you should not be used routinely for diagnosis, should be reserved for those very sick in ICU, ventilated, and whom you are thinking of an alternative diagnosis or a serious complication like ARDS. Otherwise, CT scan should not be done. It should be discouraged. And the next one is, what is the approach to a COVID positive child who is not sick but does not deprivation after five days? Extremely good question. My answer is clinical judgment. Fever is, does not come down after five days. It's a red flag sign, as I put it in my presentation. Two things you must do. One, look for some other diagnosis. Your COVID positivity may be a bystander. In fact, Dr. Janani is there. Recently, she had a case where everything looked like MISC. She had the maturity of clinical judgment. She waited for one day. She got the blood counts done. Blood culture was growing salmonella typhi. And she avoided immunomodulatory treatment. I think it is basically clinical judgment and not simply the fever chart that should direct you to a sinister diagnosis. But one the thing is, if the child has got fever for five days, even if the child is having mild COVID, I would definitely investigate not only for COVID, but also for alternative diagnosis. Thank you, sir. Another one is aspirin for all cases of MISI, sir. Can we give all cases? Yes, of yes it is recommended. The contraindications for aspirin are an acute bleeding less than 80, already, uh, sorry, uh, already there or a platelet count less than 80,000. The rationale for giving aspirin is that MISI is a vasculitis. MISI can cause thrombosis not only in coronary vessels but in other organs. Aspirin low dose is recommended for all MISI as of today. If you make a diagnosis of MISI, if there is no contraindication, you are expected to give aspirin for at least four to six weeks until you are sure the four or six week echo does not show any changes in the coronary or there is no myocardial dysfunction. So another question, use of remdesivir in pediatric COVID-19. Brilliant question. Currently remdesivir has been removed from the WHO list of drugs for COVID-19. All the Indian guidelines have removed remdesivir from the guidelines. 
but then for every rule there are exceptions the indications for remdesivir in pediatric covid would be one an immunocompromised child or a child who has a chronic disease high risk for covid who has moderate to severe disease you should consider giving remdesivir two in severe covid pneumonia you can consider remdesivir and it should be given preferably within first 5 days if not 7 days there is no point in giving remdesivir to somebody who comes to you on day 8 or day 9 of illness there only steroids and immunomodulation will work but then remdesivir i am afraid is going out and the future of therapy for covid 19 will be like what trump was given we would be giving monoclonal antibodies on day 1 of illness in fact scientists in us are now trying to identify monoclonal antibodies for the delta variant or the indian variant you shouldn't call it indian variant the delta variant they are working very hard and we may find the monoclonal antibodies once they come all the antivirals will go out of market like ivermectin or chloroquine rajendra sir can i add rajendra yeah please yeah uh, as sps said i think yes i have used remdesivir in ich covid ward for two children one of course a newborn who had very severe covid pneumonia started outside for two days so i have to complete the dose the other one is a severely acute malnourished child who came with severe covid pneumonia with uh, this one and this is the child i had an excellent recovery i started remdesivir on the third day as sir rightly told that remdesivir usage after 7 days is not at all helpful so that it's a clinical discretion that when the child comes to you with moribund state with proven covid positivity and severe pneumonia maybe the physician the pediatrician choice at least to try something that's why immunosuppressed children i we have treated 76 leukemia children 76 leukemia children all the leukemia children are referred from adr cancer institute everybody except 3 4 children they died everybody they went home went back to adr cancer institute after the beginning covid negativity but those are the children they did not go for any respiratory distress or ct changes are not there so we are not giving but one child we have to give so we gave in fact our mmc physician i think my our dme will readily accept that he may say something about this mmc physicians feels that even though central government and icmr says that our mmc physician felt remdesivir in the early period is very useful for many adult uh, covid i think our dme sir can say something about this sir sir good evening uh, as i could say that remdesivir remdesivir is a magic medicine because last wave when it is what when it is not there everyone wanted it when we are having adequately everyone told he doesn't need it when it was <laughs> it was gas it was gas outside everybody wanted it one counter in games is not sufficient to bear the numbers we increased the numbers to six counters then also they want so we have in hand but everything what we felt when it was a all out uh, attack on covid when in the first wave when we treated the patient only with the vitamins zinc and food it came and it was utilized uh, invariably in all the places and to satisfaction instead of nothing we gave it we have good things but we are having but as uh, literature shows it is moderate to severe cases uh, pediatric we, uh, at present one thing we are having adequate number of remedies were in hand beds we are having for example chennai inclusive of covid hospital covid health center oxygen center covid care center we are having 27500 beds of which as of occupied today is only 3700 so you can see that we are having 23000 odd beds outside chennai tamil nadu we are having 46000 beds today's occupancy is 17000 there are 30000 beds so when it comes in the third wave we will because seeing being it's a pandemic all the beds will be used for the pediatric 
there will not be any disparity between the adult and pediatric. All the hospital will be used for pediatric. All the institution will be used for pediatric. Only the pediatrician will be called for in the either it may be a Rajiv Gandhi or Sam. Because we are having adequate resource, vast bed strength. We are now having oxygen center of 10,000 beds. COVID care centers, we are having COVID care in, in China, having more than uh, 40,500 beds. So all the facility will be used for the children. Luckily, it is. It may, if it is so, it coming in the last, we are having all the infrastructure. Definitely everything will be used for the welfare of children. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Luckily, this time we have our DME as a pediatrician. We will be much more benefited, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so next question, can oral steroid be started as OP beds cannot be secured in, in case of moderate... Uh, um, <laughs> I'm afraid the answer is no. I don't think in pediatrics, you, I have the guts to give oral steroids with the diagnosis of moderate COVID. I would definitely hospitalize the child. And as our uh, honorable director of medical education said, the government will certainly provide all pediatric beds, even if there is a massive, somebody had put a question in the uh, uh, chat box. Is it going to be 5% of children? It's not going to be 5% of the population of children. It's going to be 5% of those who develop infection. 90% are going to be asymptomatic, 85 to 90%. So, as the DME said, Dr. Narayana Babu said, we will definitely face the situation and we can definitely admit those moderate cases. I would not give, I would not treat it as OP uh, with steroids. And with that too, I would definitely have a relook at the diagnosis. I won't give steroids as OP at all. Giving steroids to somebody with COVID-19 is not like giving one dose of steroid, three days of steroids for acute severe asthma. It's a very complicated decision. We can go wrong. We can harm the child. If it is UTI, if it is typhoid, if it is strep typhus, it may end up in a disaster if you give uh, steroids orally. Even if it is a stable child, I would monitor and if it's the moment I have a doubt about the severity of illness, I would err on the side of hospitalizing the child in such a situation. And another one is how long we should wait for response with IVIG and one to two milligram per kg of methylprednisolone in critically ill child? 48 hours. It takes about 48 hours. When I say critically ill child, 48 hours means uh, the child should show some improvement within 24 to 48 hours. But generally, it is recommended that within 48 hours, if there is no improvement, you should consider uh, stepping up the ladder. But there again, there is some disagreement between, as I said, between the Europeans and the Americans. The Americans say one to two milligram you use, and if it is refractory, go to high dose. And if it is, they are also giving anakindra. Okay. But whereas in Europe, they are giving 10 to 30 only. In fact, right now, there is another recovery trial for children is going on, where there are four arms. In one arm, they are giving only IVIG. In another arm, they are giving IVIG and steroids. Third arm, they are giving steroids. Fourth arm, IVIG, steroids, and biologic, like anakindra or tocilizumab. The results are expected to come in two to three months. But I am praying and hoping that the group receiving only steroids do very well so that our poor children we can treat without IVAG. But currently, the recommendations suggest that IVAG should be used frontline, right? In fact, the, the DCGI, the, the DCGI has given a new recommendation for pediatric COVID in which IVAG goes above MPS, but all other recommendations due to cost constraint have placed MPS above IVAG. Another one is, why is it anticipated that children will be maximally affected in the third wave? Any particular reason? See, the reason is very simple. See, they are, we are, uh, see, now somebody had also asked a question, zero prevalence. But we have done a study in our institution where we have shown between uh, April and uh, November 2020, we did across the board serology tests and we found that 21% have seropositivity, all groups, COVID, PIMS-TS, normal children, hospitalized children for some other disease, all the four groups cut across 21%. But if you do the same sero survey now 
I am sure it will be around 50 percent. The the zero positivity rate is going up. That means more and more children are also getting infected. But I don't know the latest figures. The I, ICMR is planning to do in Chennai Corporation. Also, they are giving uh, trying trying to do with NIE Chennai. We have figures. But then the virus is finding hosts. If majority of adult population are infected, then they have to have feed. So they will start infecting children. And some day or other, we have to open the schools. Lockdown will be lifted. Children are the only people who are left with. So it is expected more number of children will be infected, and the percentage of severity may not go up. Hopefully, maybe the number of cases are missing in proportion to the first wave and second wave also might not decrease, but the volume may be more. That is what we are worried about. Rajendran, can I add? Rajendran, yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, since um, we have treated around thousand eight hundred cases in ICH COVID positive children, our general observation is that a well nourished child with well immunization are not having much of a problem, and the child who is not having a very good I'm not, I'm not talking of COVID vaccination. I'm talking about other immunization, including uh, pneumococcal vaccine, H influenza vaccine, Pantavac, and other thing. What we have seen that the severely acute malnourished children. Where the nutrition fact is not very good, I think they are having a stormy session, and the, in fact, the fever is getting prolonged. They stay in the ward for more compared to the normally well immunized, well nourished child. And why pediatric population is uh, suspected to be the third wave when it's going to come? As SBS correctly told that they are the left behind. Most of them are getting infected. Point number one. Even in pediatric population, what I feel. As long as we continue our regular immunization up to five years, where the antibody level may be there up to ten to twelve years. Unfortunately, in India, ten to eighteen years there is not much of vaccination. Even though there is vaccination, not much people are having it. So I feel maybe the vulnerable population may be from ten to eighteen years. That's why the government of India given has given a pediatric and adolescent guideline for us. So it is time for us to treat even up to eighteen years. If at all some people are getting quite infected, they are maybe the vulnerable population because they will not have any innate immune response maybe after 10 years because of no vaccination at all from 10 to 18 years. That's why some of the countries started giving vaccination from 12 to 18 years also. So in a lissy stable child, markers are coming down. Echo coronary 3Z score as per cardiologist. No fever for two days. Is it necessary? IVIG and methyl prednisone are both you have to give. Okay, please, sir. <laughs> It's very simple. See, uh, if you, I'll tell you what we are doing. But well, this is not possible in a periphery. But what we are doing, if we, our protocol has been from the first case of Missy we saw, our first choice is IV immunoglobulin. Fortunately, we have been able to support even poor parents by getting some samples or. getting some donation from trustees or sources to support these children and if if they refuse what we have done very rarely if they can't afford we have documented it and given methyl prednisone so it's not a crime not to give ivig the only problem that might arise for a practitioner in pediatric practice he has a small nursing home he doesn't give ivig and he gives steroids the child lands up in problem with an aneurysm 3 weeks 3 months later and he sues you you may not be able to defend yourself because the judge will see only the protocol everywhere ivig first 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 so that's a problem in private practice but the, now the current guidelines have clearly said only steroid may be given we may be safer for a child who has a diagnosis of missy who is ill is it score or y score echo normal or abnormal you should give immunomodulator therapy and steroids should be given provided you are confident of excluding toxic shock syndrome and other infections so there is no need for you to wait for alternative diagnosis perennially you can't miss the bus but you can maybe you can even give antibiotics in addition to ivig and steroids to start with reassess with cultures reassess with clinical parameters that you repeat an echo if necessary repeat the inflammatory markers and look for alternative diagnosis and decide 
it is clinical judgment we must also remember it's impossible to give guidelines for every unusual situation that you and me are going to see in our practice impossible no guideline will answer those question it is clinical judgment holistic judgment in fact whenever i have a problem in such cases i call my post graduates i call my assistants discuss with them and i have seen post graduates coming out with valid suggestions more correct than mine that's how the procedure should be done rajendran i think uh, we'll have a uh, last few questions 8 o'clock uh, uh, almost uh, we'll wind up uh, we'll finish up sir yeah okay. role of uh, tocilizumab in children sir uh, somebody asked yeah tocilizumab is a uh, il6 inhibitor and uh, it's an immunomodulator used in rheumatoid arthritis um, its role is very limited in misi as well as in covid-19 if you look at the papers in adult covid-19 tocilizumab initially came with a lot of promise but most studies have shown no great outcome following tocilizumab and having said that like remdesivir in a given patient with mis c or covid-19 who's being given steroids who's being given immunoglobulins if the crp is high unremitting fever is still there and crp is a is a is a surrogate marker of il6 if it is very high it's more than 75 you have given ivig you have given steroids 48 hours late you have given ivig given waited for 48 hours waited for 72 hours child is still not improving if you don't have alternative diagnosis you can consider rosuluzumab in the west they have the luxury of having anakindra that's what they are recommending is not available i believe it is available in bangalore it's slightly costlier than tocilizumab probably safer than tocilizumab very soon we will have anakindra probably we will be using more of anakindra than tocilizumab at this juncture i want to mention in adult covid-19 the new drug called baricitinib an oral jack kinase inhibitor which costs only 5 to 20 rupees per tablet single dose 4 mg in adults given for 7 to 10 days in combination with either usul uh, uh, your remdesivir or with steroids has shown dramatic results and then nih has approved its use for adults but in children 2 to 18 years of age baricitinib is not approved maybe in future this drug may emerge thank you sir i think it is almost 500 delegates attended the meeting it's so happy ஒருஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்கஸ்ட்ரங்க
definitely the iap should uh, uh, come forward for all the uh, process like uh, um, processing protocols management and we will have a close coordination thank you sir rajendra sir rajendra sir rajendra sir award award rajendra sir our our dme is a very courageous person as long as he is there we are all very safe in the tamil nadu point number 1 point number 2 He has visited all the COVID ward. He went inside and posed with the COVID patients also. I used to say that it is virus panja katta, not uh, <laughs> virus panja katta. So he said it's a COVID family. So he is the most courageous DME we have seen entering the COVID ward without any inhibition. Also, I, I think he has, he has visited all the COVID wards. So that is the uh, trademark of our DME also, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Certainly, he started from Coimbatore. <laughs> he started a journey from Coimbatore. Thank you, sir. Anyway, Srinivas and sir, one thing I wanted to make a comment. This all, you guys, under parag, enga manasala thodra thena na. All malar karam baadigwa. Prachini all sir engle. All that sir. Why kya all that sir? Just one small. This is small comment, Dr. Raj. Just one, Dr. Raj, just one small comment. Dr. S B S sir, Ram Allah Pesting. Thank you. Just you told very clearly C R P of more than fifty milligram per liter. But in the slide, it was saying as yes, five milligram per liter. I'm this is probably an error. Please change it because decilitre. yeah, decilitre. Decilitre. please change it, sir. Yeah. This will be circulated to people. That's it. Thank you. Five milligram per deciliter. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. And because of I F P, I request uh, Dr. Kolanesani, sir, he is a uh, uh, F P uh, that is a uh, state task force uh, committee member as well as our D M E also. Dr. Narayan Babu sir also task 